everyone. I'm Katie Darrell. And today we are at home and social with Wesley Schultz of the Lumineers. Congratulations. Album four, my friend. Album four. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. I been, feel like we've been waiting a long time to put it out. So it's, it's so nice that it's, it's going to be out. Yeah. Well, oddly, the last two years have sort of dragged, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oddly. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Well, the album is called Bright Side. Title track is also called Bright Side and uh, hitting number one all over the place. That's got to feel nice, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it means that a lot of people are hearing it, which is really exciting for us. You know, you spend a lot of time, you know, writing and recording and you just that's what every artist is hoping for is that it gets heard. So for us, it's it's not, so, you know, it's mostly about encourage encouragement that it, the world is finally hearing this new thing that you hope doesn't get like somehow ignored. You know, like that's everybody's fear when you're working so hard on stuff. Sure. Absolutely. Now, obviously I'm going to dive really hardcore into the album in the process, but I want to uh, connect some weird dots for our fans and viewers that are watching. Um, Liam and Noel, Noel Gallagher of Oasis, um, they were like in the room with you, sort of. Can you tell us the story <laughs> of the uh, the photo that you had posted in the studio when you were recording? Yeah, just just judging us uh, yeah. in our uh, American style rock. Um, no, I, they they were big inspirations um, in the sense that our producer Simon Felice put a put a photo of the backs actually of Liam and Noel as they were facing this crowd of two hundred thousand plus people at a place called Nebworth. In, uh, in, in somewhere in the UK and in the countryside. Um, so they played a number of, of concerts, uh, I don't know, maybe a couple decades ago. And our, our producer, Simon Fleece said, I, I need you guys to understand that you and my, my songwriting partner, and, and I played with him for 16 years, Jeremiah, uh, are you're the Lumineers in the sense that you write the songs and you need to start embracing that role and understanding that and not always just being like oh shucks you know you kind of have to own it a little bit because you guys are that and it was good for us to hear so yeah Liam and Noel and their sort of bravado um entered the room pretty early and it, it really helped it helped write the record hopefully it didn't inspire you guys to fight and want to break <laughs> up <laughs> no nah, we, we don't want to break up but we fight like anybody I mean 16 years you're gonna uh, you're going to have your differences, but um, he lives in, he actually lives in Italy now, Jer, not because of some bad fight we had, but just because he, he married an Italian uh, woman named Fra Francesca. And um, so it, it's funny because we used to live together and we used to work our side jobs together and tour together and write together. We never had time apart. And uh, this feels a lot more like we have our own space. And I think it'll keep us together longer, ironically, him having his own lane in Italy. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Do you think um, with Jeremiah moving to Italy, um, did it, did that separation of you guys kind of having these separate lives um, feel easier to embrace because of COVID because everyone was in their own little pods? Yeah. I mean, uh, during, so for the first, I would say six to eight months of the lockdown, uh, we were, a mile and a half apart, but we didn't see each other. It, you know, she's from Italy, his wife, and she was really cautious. My wife was really cautious. And I think Jer and I were a little more like cavalier, I guess, but it, we, we, we went with their preference, you know, we weren't going to make them uncomfortable. So we didn't meet up for a while at the song, right? Uh, Wes, and I then, believe the term is happy wife, happy yeah, life. <laughs> yeah. That's what they say. Um, it's hard. Cause my wife, and anyone who's married to a musician knows a couple of things. One is that you're sort of, you're on the road a lot and they'd prefer that you were home a little bit more and, and that uh, you're sort of married to the music and that other person you write with, if you're in my position where you're collaborating with another person in Jer. So um, I have like two wives, I feel like, you know, it's, like, uh, it's just the way it is. But um, yeah, we didn't, we didn't see each other for a while. And then we finally got together and we were, we were testing constantly and trying to sing with a mask on and then took those off pretty quickly. And we're just writing together in a room. And that was just a, that felt like getting back to normal in some really tiny way, really mm -hmm. small way, because it had felt so alien, you know, to, to make contact with anyone outside of your little house, your little bubble. And um, eventually he moved, but the way that we have written for the last, you know, 16 years, 
almost all the ideas come independent and then we we kind of workshop them in the, in the room once they're a little further along so it works fine with what we do and and he's he's so happy over there because she's so happy so it worked out you know what i mean it's just um it's nice that he can afford a flight back when he needs to i don't think we could have done this in 2000 you know 10 or 11 or something like that yeah. You mentioned uh, the workshopping uh, of a song. So um, for those of you just joining us, I'm Katie Darrell, and he is Wes Schultz of the Lumineers. Uh, and this is At Home and Social on Access TV. Now with workshopping songs, I know you you do most of the writing, the, the lyric writing, and then you guys come together and you write the songs. Um, do you ever feel possessive of an idea or a line or something that you just really are just like, oh, but this little nugget, I really like, but that one's mine. This one's mine and I'm taking it back. <laughs> um, yeah, like sometimes you do a little bit, but I think we make it a, a habit to try to serve the song and, and try to shed as much ego as you can. So there are certain things, like on this last album, I remember Jer really liked, ironically, he liked something I had written and he really wanted that to be in a certain song and it was almost gonna end up in this other song. And then he kind of fought for it to live somewhere else. So I think a lot of it has to do with feeling like the song would be better served or would be better off mm -hmm. with this idea, with that idea. But, you know, you, you said just a minute ago, I write most of the lyrics and, and I do, but I also, there's plenty of examples. It often comes in like a hook. So on our first album, something like Slow It Down, that was something Jared just said in passing on a voice memo. And then on this most recent album, there's a lot of examples like, uh, where we are, I don't know where we are. That he he sent me that. He sent me this birthday memo this, for this song called Birthday. Um, there's a lot of examples where he says things that I would never say it that way, and I really appreciate that. It's like a very direct way of of communicating, you know, his, his style of of, of lyrics. So um, whereas I feel like I dance around it a lot and, and sort of in like a more poetry fashion, he's more like straight to the point. And I think it's it's almost that innocence is like so beautiful. So I could never write these songs. You know, both of us, I think, rely heavily on each other to, to have the end result. But it's it's hard. I mean, that's why the Gallagher brothers like fight like hell, because it's confusing sometimes. And you have to kind of work through most of it is working through your uh, your successes. It's like the failures you bond together. The successes all of a sudden, you know, your ego can flare up. So we, we just try hard to. To, to appreciate one another and, and keep keep the keep everything going because we feel like it's worth it. It's like we found something special after being in many bands, you know. The new album by the Lumineers is called Bright Side. It is uh, available uh, January 14th. And you mentioned um, voice memos. And I know that in the past you've utilized um, recording on your phone and doing a lot on your laptops and, and going into the studio uber prepared. And yeah. you did something a little bit different this time with, not that you weren't prepared, but you didn't try to like map it out and have it basically done before going into the studio. Was that a silver lining of COVID and having the time to breathe and not be writing while on the road on tour as well? Or how did that decision get made? Well, I think for me, it got made, I made a solo record at the same time Jer had made a solo record um, on the in the beginning of the pandemic and that was sort of I think each of our ways to ease back into writing because it was when we sit down together it feels kind of pressurized it feels like you want to you want every album to be better than the last and you want fans to trust that what you put out there's never something to skip you know it's like raised on someone like Tom Petty or Billy Joel or the cars like there's so many good songs they've written that you don't want to put out a dud. You want them to all be on a high level. Yeah, you want to uh, hit whereas, play and listen to the whole album. Yeah, and whereas like with the solo record, I was just doing cover songs, which is where we kind of came from. We played a lot of bars and I did that before I started playing with Jer. So I was, I went into the studio really unprepared other than, you know, when I, when I hear it, I'll know it. So we would, we'd pick out a song. We'd usually record two in a day and, I was always surprised that it came out as well as it did because I never recorded that way. I never trusted that you could make something spontaneously and it would actually be good. Um, and so that experience really shaped the approach for me on that fourth album on Bright Side because 
I had this idea in my head, like, well, we, it's happened to us a couple of times in the past, you know, someone like Angela, I remember playing the, our second album, Cleopatra for my wife. And she liked the song Angela more than any other song on the record on first listen. There was something really immediate about it. And it became like sort of an eternal song. It'll be on every set list, most likely. But that was like a buzzer beater. That was a last minute addition to the album. And we did it really fast. And I thought, well, what if we did that for the whole record? You know, what if what if all of them were like barely constructed? They were just like a time, a rough sketch. And then we went in and we just saw what happened. It was almost like improvisation versus writing the script and having every pause and every beat and every line mapped out. It was almost like asking the actors to just play a little bit and have yeah. some fun and see what happens while shooting. Um, that was sort of what was happening. And, you know, the results, I think, speak for themselves because we've already played the songs live to audiences that have never heard the album and they're already responding. So, so I don't know, passionately or strongly, considering that they're mostly waiting for songs they've already heard. It's not like comedy where you want to hear a new joke. <laughs> a lot of music is like you want to hear these things because you have memories attached to them and you have a an idea of this song as a part of your life. So it's it's a really amazing sign when people can sort of get with the music right away. When you're writing songs um, and creating music, do you do you like to tell the store a story more or do you like to get a feeling more across in a song? What's more important to you? I think I like uh, in the past, I really love writing stories. You know, I thought that, that those are a lot of my heroes wrote growing up in New Jersey at Bruce Springsteen. And then my uncle introduced me to Bob Dylan music. And then um, Leonard Cohen was a big thing my dad listened to. Um, and then within uh, just basically storytelling was a big part of what my, my dad liked. And I listened to all the songs with him. And then, but he also got me in into the talking heads and David Byrne, he, the way he writes lyrics is so visceral. It's so, um, uh, primal it's like doesn't always make sense intellectually but you kind of understand it in some weird like your caveman understands it inside of you and same with growing up on nirvana same with neil young all, all these that style of writing is much more there's poetry in that and it's less about like a folk oriented story so i think in the past i wrote <clears throat> i set out to write stories i really wanted to do that and for some reason with this album it felt like it felt more exciting to write in a different way and to try to do that in the way that it, it hit my heart listening to those other artists. So th this album is much more of that, uh, that feeling. And if you're trying to figure out kind of what happened in the song, you're, you're probably not thinking about it the right way. You don't really need to be thinking about it. It's just kind of going to hit you. And hopefully we're, we're feeling the same thing collectively when we hear it. Uh, for those of you just joining us, I'm Katie Darrell. He is Wesley Schultz of The Lumineers. Their new album is called Bright Side, available now. Um, you know, a lot of fans, you know, we were talking about feelings and emotions in the songs. For instance, your song, Ophelia. It, it brings me to this great place where I would be driving around Los Angeles and I have my son, my firstborn, my only child in the back seat. He's about a year and a half. So just a lot of goo goo gaga talk. And he <laughs> would get the uh oh, Ophelia part down pat and it was so cute because i you know i barely even listened to the lyrics other than i was always waiting for the uh oh philia part <laughs> because it was so fun to have this with you when you hear other artists music and you have those feelings and and those memories of songs speaking of ego do you set your ego aside and are you able to share that with them when you tour with them or meet them for instance you've toured with like you too was there a you too song that you're like Hey, Bono, <laughs> let me just set it all down and let me just tell you. And, and Or do you have to keep up this facade of, hey, you're a rock star, I'm a rock star. We don't have, we're not like, you know, like, is there, is, what's the vibe? No, I mean, I think I'm, I think I'm just prone to, um, <clears throat> I'm prone to, I'm very much, it's easier for me to give a compliment to, than to receive one. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm not alone there, but like when I meet certain people, you know, I, I remember seeing Dave Matthews and being like, you're one of my musical heroes. You know, we opened for him. And I don't even think he knew what to do with that because he was like, he had already paid me a compliment earlier in the tour. And uh, it's like a lot to put on somebody. Yeah. Um, but I don't mind saying it because I really feel it. But with, yeah, with you two, I, we got to talk to them a bit. And I, 
I got to say some things to them that their music meant to me, but more I was expressing that it's incredible that they made, at the time they were touring on Joshua Tree and it was the 30 year mm -hmm. anniversary of it. And um, the story behind that, which is almost equally fascinating is that they were supposed to be doing an arena run with their new album, but they hadn't finished it. <clears throat> so their management said, well, it's almost 30 years it's about 30 years on this album, let's do a reunion on this. And they said, we don't really like to look back, but that's not a bad idea. And then all of a sudden we went from arenas to stadiums, like overnight, because yes. they said they were gonna be playing the Joshua Tree album front to back. And uh, I just said, you know, it's amazing bringing friends to your shows that they become a little bit jaded and like sort of out of touch with what makes you two you two because they've been relevant for so long. And then they would be in the middle of the show and start weeping, you know, crying at this music. They're the most like some of them are some of the most jaded kind of hipster types. And I said, your music, that's transcendence, you know, like that's it gets through all these different types of people, all these different walks of life. It cuts through all of that. And. Um, and I remember saying something like that to, to the edge and he goes and I said, you know, it's like. We really like, we had this song I referenced earlier, Slow It Down, and it's cool to open for your fans and they're open to this music and it's just two of us out there. And uh, he pauses and he smiles and he goes, it's also good to have hits. <laughs> and then he like, that's all he said. And I was like, wow, like, I didn't understand what he meant at first, but I think he understood that with you too, there was always this icebreaker. It was like, when you meet someone at a bar, you have to open with something. You can't just be like, I love you. You know, like there's, you <laughs> yeah. can't, you're not going to go straight into all that. You have to, you have to sort of often a lead single or a, a hit like Ophelia. Hopefully it gets people into the rest of the record Yeah, because that's where you, you put the energy in all of it. And just like having bright side um, in certain, on certain charts being number one, it was like, it just means hopefully that we've broken the ice with people. We've let them know there's a new album out. And for that, we feel lucky because is there's a lot of music coming out literally every day. The new Luminaires album is called Bright Side. Make sure everyone gets their hands on it. Wes, um, yeah, spe I, I feel this this final question is going to tie into everything you just said because it is about the hits and it, you, the gateway drug of getting to know the Lumineers, right? Uh, a lot of people first uh, attach themselves and their, their likings of you to the song uh, Ho Hey, which came out in 2012. Here's the irony, and I love this. I love this, this fact that I found out about you guys. For those of you just watching, I mean, th this song has sold over 5 million copies, so it's huge. If you haven't heard it, you've been living under a rock. Um, Spotify in October of 2012 said that Ho Hey was the most shared song in Manhattan and Brooklyn. <laughs> this was a town that you guys tried to kind of get your foothold and started yeah. and had to move to Denver because you were working too many jobs and just couldn't afford it and do it. And then you moved to Denver and then all of a sudden Manhattan and Brooklyn is like, Oh, Hey, <laughs> they took us in. Yeah. Yeah. It was weird. I, I remember um, doing research, just trying to crack the code and figure out how do you play the Mercury lounge? That's like all I ever wanted to do. Um, we were, we, we sometimes, we once got into Rockwood Music Hall in the living room. These were like the coolest places to play, but Mercury Lounge felt like the mountaintop. And I made like a little binder and I was trying to figure out like, I don't get it. Every time we submit a demo, it's crickets. And then we moved to Denver and they let us in. It was the weirdest thing. So I, I, I still don't quite understand that, but um, for, again, for a city as wild and, you know, the, it's sort of the center of the universe for, you know, the entertainment world music in a lot of ways. And to have, to have that, I remember we were at the Clive Davis party that year and, and he said that on the mic and we were like, oh, really? Because we, we kind of felt rejected by that city. And then to have to come back to it and be embraced was, was really special. So um, hard to explain, but <laughs> I guess you just have to like be patient and we'll hope that they, they come around to whatever you're trying to express because it doesn't always happen right away. You know, for us, certainly it didn't. Um, for those people that are about to click purchase on the latest Lumineers album, Bright Side, what can they look forward to? What's a secret gem um, that, that you want them to know about this album? Well, um, I forget who said it. I don't even think history knows who said it, but there's this line that they say, if I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. 
and I like th this is a 30 minute record and it feels to me like an hour it's got like a lot in it for a, a brief record and um so I think there's just a lot to it in a short period of time and it's us just I think you'll hear us in a new way having way more fun it was like the the inner critic the OCD side of us was put to the side and we were just like kids in the studio just like exploring different things with curiosity and not that's the benefit of I think a lot of bands as they get more as they make more records they they feel less compelled to do things they never wanted to do and they mm -hmm. just do exactly what they want to do and that's I feel like we're lucky enough to say that's where we're at so uh, I think you'll hear I think you'll hear a different side of us and a more playful side on this album awesome I'm looking forward to it yeah thanks so much all right, Wesley Schultz of the Lumineers. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah, you too. Hey there. Thanks for watching Access TV. Subscribe, follow, like, and do all the good stuff. And make sure you leave a comment below. I don't know. Just let us know what your favorite Access TV show is or who your favorite bands are and what artists you're into. Or just say hi, man. I'd like to be told hi. We love hearing from you. That's the point. All right? Keep it coming.